Heather Gold, she's an associate professor in the division um, and also an assistant director of health disparities and outcomes research at the Cancer Institute. Uh, Heather uh, uh, recently came to us from Cornell. Um, happy for us. Uh, she uh, got a PhD at the University of Rochester, um, a master's degree in public policy in the University of Chicago, um, and a bachelor's degree in biology from uh, UC San Diego. Um, so her research is on uh, identifying and evaluated uh, socioeconomic, racial, and geographic disparities in cancer care, um, and also uh, adoption of new technologies, which she's going to be talking to us today. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming today. This is work uh, with um, Maddie Murphy, who is at Cornell, but also at the University of Barbados, who's <laughs> the name I can't exactly remember right now. Um, with Kim Petrelli, who's here in the audience, she's our research coordinator, and with Mary Kay Hayes, who is a radiation oncologist at Weill Cornell Medical College. This is uh, work, we're about a year and a half into the three-year project, funded by the American Cancer Society. It's a two-pronged project. This, uh, the preliminary work that I'm showing you today is actually a qualitative analysis, which is relatively new to me. Um, most of my work is, is quantitatively oriented, but uh, it's really fun to try to understand the nuance of decision making and how people, in this case, are adopting new technology and why they're adopting new technology. Our case today is looking at accelerated partial breast irradiation, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is. Just a little bit of background on breast cancer. Almost 130,000 women are diagnosed with early invasive breast cancer every year. Um, and the standard treatment options are mastectomy, or a woman can get lumpectomy, also called breast conserving surgery, with whole breast radiotherapy. Whole breast radiotherapy typically requires four to seven weeks of daily treatment, depending on the protocol that's followed. But what we know is um, about whole breast radiation therapy is that it prevents local recurrence, distant metastasis, and improves overall survival for breast cancer patients. However, the clinical trial data indicate that the rates of same and opposite side carcinomas are identical following whole breast radiation. And so what this suggests is that the whole breast radiation is not having an impact on tumors elsewhere in the breast, the new tumors that are forming, forming are new primaries. And that this also suggests that whole breast radiation has a benefit in the breast tissue immediately surrounding the tumor cavity and not in the rest of the breast. So there's a new technology that's been driven by this um, notion that maybe we should target more locally the radiation rather than risking uh, side effects and other problems with the rest of the breast and, let, and perhaps target just that tumor area. So accelerated partial breast irradiation um, takes five days. It's very narrowly focused radiation delivering radiation only to the tumor bed. And um, it may have some benefits. It comes in many forms, and I'll describe those to you. So one example of accelerated partial breast irradiation, or APBI, is called balloon brachytherapy. The mammocyte device was first approved in 2002. And you see a picture here where the surgeon temporarily implants a balloon-like device into the tumor bed. This is done after surgery. There are some physicians who will implant upon uh, in what they call uh, in the open setting. So they, they put the balloon in right at the time of surgery. Most physicians wait. Um, and so then a uh, seed of high dose radiation is inserted through a catheter into this balloon-like device. The patient gets treated for five to 10 minutes on an outpatient setting twice a day for five days. Since the original mammocyte device was approved, there are new types of devices out there. The Savvy, the Contura, and a second generation mammocyte balloon that are multi-lumen catheters. And those may actually allow for better dosing of the radiation rather than uh, the single lumen original mammocyte device. This uh, brachytherapy requires a um, 
a high dose rate machine, an HDR machine, which is very expensive to purchase. So if a, a hospital or a radiation oncology center doesn't have one, they need to think hard about the, the capital investment into this HDR machine. There are potential advantages of accelerated partial breast radiation, and um, one, one goal, as I mentioned, was to intensify the radiation dose to the area at greatest risk for disease. The five-year brachytherapy data show that local recurrence rates are equivalent to whole breast radiotherapy, but there aren't good randomized trial data uh, that exist just yet. The, um, there's another form of accelerated partial breast irradiation that's important to bring up here because it is part of our study as well. It's called 3D conformal external beam radiotherapy. And the idea is to use the same external beam modality as you would find with whole breast radiotherapy, but you target it in, in a much narrower field. So um, other potential advantages of accelerated partial breast irradiation is that it could reduce acute and chronic toxicity, it may improve cosmetic outcome, and it could possibly allow for future breast radiotherapy. So a person can only have a total lifetime dose of radiation. If a woman were to get um, partial breast irradiation for an initial, uh, uh, following an initial lumpectomy, if she were to have a recurrence later, there is a possibility she could get whole breast radiation down the road. There haven't been studies on that. The technology and techniques are, are too new for that. There's um, a potential for improved quality of life due to better cosmesis, better cosmetic outcome from accelerated partial breast irradiation, um, less fatigue, and um, the shorter course of therapy is much uh, lighter burden for this kind of treatment. And finally, I would argue that this type of radiation could allow an inter intermediate option for radiation for older women or people who have comorbidities, it's hard to travel, things like that. So even if it's not equally as effective as whole breast radiation, perhaps it could be some kind of intermediate modality for people who wouldn't get any radiation treatment. Any other questions? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't understand some, so as I understood, the argument for using APBI was that the um, rate of recurrence in the breast that was irradiated was the same as in the other ones, and the thought was it's probably a new primary tumor, right? If I got that. that and what I'm looking at is that here it says that the <coughs> data show that the recurrence rate was also the what the, data? Sorry. The, the uh, APBI, the yeah. recurrence rate was the same for partially irradiated versus radiated the whole breast, which earlier I thought you were saying was also the same as the recurrence rate on the opposite side, so it was a new primary. Okay, so let me see if I can um, disentangle this, and we have a radiation oncologist who I can always harass about the <laughs> clinical data too. Um, my understanding is that when people get whole breast radiation, um, the um, elsewhere tumor occurrence rate is the same. Um, I have that slide actually, and um, maybe that would be helpful. So, um, the, the right, the recurrence rate in other areas is the same. The elsewhere tumor uh, failure, uh, elsewhere tumors, and so those must all be new primary. So the whole breast radiation is really only helping that small area of tissue where the tumor was. Okay, because the rates of other primaries are the same. Um, these, um, I'm sorry, in the yeah. same breast? The yeah, because whole breast radiation breast. Only, only affects the breast that's irradiated. So it's, mm -hmm. it's in other quadrants, right? Rates of other quadrant tumors are the same. It doesn't have to do oh, with the oh, like, oh, contralateral oh. or opposite breast. Okay, so that rates of tumors in the, re in the other quadrants of the breast are the same as for the entire other side of the breast, taking out that quadrant. Yes. I okay, I got it. Right. And then this is saying the rate within the quadrant is the same whether you got partial breast versus whole breast. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, ah, so I think I think we are done. Any other questions?
Uh, to some degree, I'll show you. Um, not nearly as much, and it becomes an issue in this um, notion about adoption of the technology. And, and yeah. Why is it that? Um, so I, I'm actually I'm familiar with. I think that's 3D conformal radi radiation therapy, 3D CRT, and I think it's been used for a long time in patients with prostate cancer. So I'm, I'm just curious why it hasn't been more widely adopted in in breast cancer. Um, well, I'll get to that a little bit in what we're, the, our findings. It seems people don't think there are not, there's enough evidence. So even though there may be evidence in prostate, there's not as much evidence in breast. But it also depends on whom you talk to. Here at NYU, they don't do balloon brachytherapy, but they'll do 3D CRT. Um, so anyway, there just aren't as many long-term um, and or randomized studies of 3D conformal in, in breast cancer. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the risks specifically of mammocyte. Um, uh, just so you have a sense, there are risks. <laughs> There's a risk of infection. Some physicians will put all their patients on an antibiotic before implanting the device. Um, there are seromas can occur um, at the site, at the tumor bed, and some of these can last for months. We've talked to some physicians who, suggest, who say that um, patients get, or these seromas get confused with inflammatory breast cancer, and patients get very nervous, and it takes a lot to resolve some seromas. Not all the time, but that can be the case. The balloons can rupture, and there are other um, things that, that can happen with the um, balloon brachytherapy. Okay, what about the cost of treatment? Um, the, um, for the um, brachytherapy-based treatment, I put Mammocyte here. It's actually from the Mammocyte website. They handily provide information on what, how much you can make off this. Okay, so surgeons are not typically involved in radiation treatment, but if they get involved in balloon brachytherapy, it's the surgeon who's implanting the balloon. And so they get almost $4,000 reimbursement um, if they do this in their private office. Um, if they're doing it in the hospital, they get a lot less, but uh, there's still some remuneration there. These rates here are 2011 Medicare reimbursement rates. It's an 8% increase over ten, two, uh, year 2010 rates, so there was some advocacy and lobbying going on, which is kind of interesting. Um, and um, I will also say that overall whole breast radiation treatment costs around $8,000 or reimbursed at about $8,000 by Medicare. Mammocyte or balloon brachytherapy total reimbursement is around $19,000, so $8,000 compared to $19,000. And 3D conformal radiation therapy is about the same as whole breast, it's $7,800. And Heather, that's, those are, that number is sort of all pieces, so this part, whatever the, you know, radiation oncologist is doing. Yeah, there are extra CT scans that are required to um, um, look at placement of the device and all kinds of other things that have to happen. And Heather, are you going to talk in, at all about the uh, Medicare's, sort of the timing, how things, how the, the evolution of reimbursement, so in terms of when the device was approved and when. Can you share that? Because I know that that's been an issue with other new technology. Yeah, so um, it wasn't, um, it, it comes up a little bit in the work here. It's more part of a, the other project, which is looking at broad diffusion of the use of the technology in, in the Medicare population across the United States. Um, reimbursement rates were really high at the start. I mean, there was, it was like, hey, get on board because. Um, so it was approved huge. immediately. It was approved in 2002 by the FDA. High reimbursement rates. They've come down slowly over time, but then this past year they got a, a little bump up again. Um, I haven't tracked them explicitly, you know, looking at what it is each year over time yet, but, um, but um, they. That's typical with Medicare, that they have an initial high reimbursement rate for new technology, and then as people 
think about it more, maybe. Um, they realize it maybe uh, shouldn't be so high. But I think, um, I, at least I've thought a lot about this in this project, what does the money mean and what is the impact of this? Okay, so let me just tell you, there is a randomized phase three study comparing whole breast radiation to partial breast radiation. And the, um, the way they've randomized is you get either whole breast radiation with an optional boost, or you get randomized to the other arm, which is mammocyte, single lumen, or 3D conformal external beam radiation. And my understanding is most of the folks getting randomized to partial breast are getting 3D conformal. Is um, that their choice? Or it's the physician's choice. The physician. Mm -hmm. It's whatever the physician uses, I guess, typically. So they had um, 4,300 patients enrolled, um, started in 2005. They're looking at the primary endpoint of recurrence. Um, first result, results are anticipated in 2016. Um, so far, there have only been phase two trials and case series, so NCI is sponsoring the phase three trial. They're also looking at other secondary endpoints. I don't need to outline today unless you're really interested. Um, also, there's a mammocyte registry that the company, Hologic, thank you, put together. Um, they enrolled about 15, or they treated about 1,500 patients from 2002 to 2004 in the mammocyte registry, and they're planning for seven-year follow-up. So um, they had some 2010 results. So of course, it's showing it's great. So. There's no randomization. Okay, so what's the purpose of this project? As I mentioned, this is something kind of new to me, looking qualitatively at, at the topic of um, adoption of technology. And the idea is to look at determinants of adoption and non-adoption of accelerated partial breast irradiation by both physicians and patients. And we're using this qualitative analysis. We do know that um, even without the randomized trial, long-term randomized trial evidence, there are thousands of women just in Medicare receiving this treatment. So we have some preliminary analysis of Medicare and, and um, we'll be continuing that as we go along. So what did we do? And I'm telling you, this is preliminary, so um, I welcome your feedback as I talk to you about this. Um, I guess even if it were finished, I'd welcome you. <laughs> uh, what did we do? We developed an interview guide that we pilot tested and we revised and revised and revised. Um, and some of the types of questions that we were asking were things like this. When you're thinking of adopting a new technology or treatment type, where do you get your information? We wanted to find out, you know, is it things like journals? Is it your colleagues? Is it clinical guidelines? Uh, you know, device manufacturers? Just generally, any new technology, where do you get your information? We're interviewing surgeons and radiation oncologists. Those are the physicians, and that's what I'm focusing on today, is just the physician component. We also ask, guidelines notwithstanding, are there certain patients you target with partial breast irradiation? This is not to understand the, um, uh, the, the idea with this is to understand our are there certain patients they think might not adhere to whole breast radiation? And so they say, oh, those, that class of patients, I would think about using partial breast radiation. Um, it's not just the, I'm actually not interested in clinical aspects there. I'm really interested in the social aspect of the patient. Do they work full time and so it's easier for them to get in for partial breast radiation, things like that. Yes? Do you want feedback on the questions? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, it just happens I, I do have expertise in qualitative. Uh -huh. I do a lot of that. I mean, um, the first thing I'll say is that it's really not the questions that are important, it's the answers you're getting. So if you're getting good oh, answers, yeah. you're okay. Sure. Um, that being said, you know, what, I, what, what what's tend to be uh, more effective is just the true open-ended and you can have some type of prompts mm -hmm. that, that guide you. But like for the second question, would lend itself to a yes, no? Right, so, so so that's what it looks like here. These are grabbed off the page, but we have a lot of probes, and I give a lot of, I in many cases I'll give examples, and these are the shorthand version because we're on a slide here. Right. So, you know, when I say guidelines notwithstanding, it's 
without regard to the clinical a aspect of your or clinical characteristics of your patient. So now what I'm, I'm wondering, are there other social factors of the patient you know, that, and, I, and we do mostly, they're mostly open-ended. So Maddie M Murphy is our qualitative research expert, mm -hmm. and she pushes me all the time on the open-ended stuff and yeah. the developing a rapport and using probes, and that's all part of this. I was just trying to give you a little snapshot of the types of things we're getting at. No, it's great. I mean, I guess my, my phone would be like simple and better, so I would have just, like for number two would have been, um, how do you choose or how do you target patients with that? Like right, they always want to go to the clinical stuff. And then and then they'll go in and then you yeah. can redirect, redirect them. Yeah, like, you we know, do. I mean, just, you know, like, like I said, I don't want to make a big deal on this, but, you know, if you need some help with that. So yeah, I'm happy to share that. the entire guide if you want. Um, so some of the other things that we talk about are, or that we ask can you tell me about your colleagues or other people with whom you discuss new technologies or practices? What are any barriers to new technologies? What guidelines do you follow? Um, that's for adopters only. There are a whole variety of guidelines, clinical guidelines, for using partial breasts. There's the American Society of Breast Surgeons, American Brachytherapy Society, American Society for Therapeutic and Radiation Oncology, Mammocyte, it, it's an amazing and incredible list and they change frequently, or not that frequently, but there are, there's enough variety in the guidelines where we're very curious. Are they using the broadest guidelines that would bring in the most patients? Or are they using the narrowest guidelines that would restrict their patient population who they would consider eligible for the treatment? Um, we also talked to them a bit about the referral process for radiotherapy to find out when is um, the, s the surgeon talking to the radiation oncologist, when are the patients talking to whom about what, just to try to understand, because different practices um, vary. Okay, so I have a fabulous recruiter by the name of Kim Petrelli sitting up there. Um, <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> she deserves a ton of credit for helping with all the recruitment. We're finding radiation oncologists and surgeons both through healthcare institutions and through basically cold calling. Um, and we've used purposive and snowball sampling. When we target through healthcare institutions, we are looking for a balance of urban and non urban facilities, academic and non academic facilities. Um, we, we are doing a fair amount of uh, cold calling and, and I think have pretty decent success although the actual rate of accrual might be smaller than all of Kim's effort, but it's been great. Um, so far, we have 27 community surgeons and radiation oncologists. We have interviewed some academic um, physicians, but they are not part of this study. They have very different kinds, they're a different beast, as you can imagine. Um, we also <coughs> have not start, started targeting patients the patients will only come through healthcare institutions, not obviously through cold calling, because they're very hard to find that way. Um, so, so that's an ongoing and kind of painful thing, uh, patient recruitment. We could talk about that later. How did you yeah. rack, like, are you <clears throat> We're looking all, all over the country? Over the place. Yeah. It's you know, because you, you think that um, that cancer care, in particular, you know, I think when doctors think about sort of the best places for cancer care, it really does sort of there, it's I, I sort of, I think I, a lot of people probably imagine satellites and I wonder, mm -hmm. I mean, probably most of those places, at least on this coast, are academic. Mm -hmm. On the west coast, maybe not as much. But um, but I wonder if, um, if that's kind of been an issue, sort of clustering. I mean, just because well, that's you know, where so it's really, the stuff's it's, happening. It's really interesting. In qualitative research, you don't have to get a representative sample or sample size the same way you do with quantitative. So I'll just lay that out there. Not if you don't want a representative sample size, right? Yeah, no, no. I mean, you. so our goal is 144 interviews, which is humongous in qualitative research. And we'll probably achieve saturation before that and won't meet, which means we've got all the themes and all the ideas we need before we get to that. That's our goal. Um, the initial, when I developed the initial proposal, I was only going through healthcare institutions. So I had found several urban, several non-urban. 
um, hospitals, HMO, like a whole variety of places, um, academic, non-academic. And what I realized is I forgot this really important population of private practice physicians who are, I don't know if the drivers of the technology, but you saw from the money, I mean, they're getting huge remuneration for this. And so then we needed to think creatively, how are we going to get this other population that is going to enrich this sample and this study so much in a way that um, the original plan just wasn't going to get. And so, you know, it's, I wouldn't say exactly it's random <laughs> how we're getting folks, but it's kind of random. It's like, mm, okay, Montana, mm, Utah, you know, I mean, and, and we do try to look um, for the non-urban because they're so much harder to get. Um, you'll see our... I'm surprised they exist, actually. For yeah, they years. absolutely, they absolutely <laughs> do. Um, so it's been, it's been an evolving process, figuring out how... So even before it was funded, I had um, letters of support from healthcare institutions, six of them around the country, saying they would help me recruit, they would help me recruit the patients, recruit the physicians. Um, and it's been a little disappointing because um, of HIPAA stuff, IRB stuff, all these different things have really gotten in the way, I think, of a very effective and efficient recruitment. Uh, and so we've just gone to, I mean, we are continuing to go through institutions and we're trying hard. What we do at an institution is find a key leader who's going to, you know, get the lasso and get folks in to, um, to participate in this. But, it's been, a, it's been a challenge. I mean, that's research, right? You don't always get what you think you're going to get. Um, you're not going to find who you think you're going to find. So, how, how long is the interview typically and how much do you get the competition? I going to get to that. Oh, yeah. We sure do. We pay. We pay. So the interviews are 30 minutes um, at the most. Um, we also get uh, additional information about the physician's practice, how long they've been in practice, what's um, how many breast cancer patients did they see out of the total? What's their insurance breakdown, like their case mix uh, or their insurance mix? Um, we pay physicians $200, and, um, <coughs> and they all seem to like that. And then we also, you know, our site coordinators, we pay $1,500 to help us recruit at the institutions. I mean, maybe it's a HIPAA issue, but it seems to me that um, often these decisions are made between the patient and the physician. So if you were able to interview one of the patients from one of these physicians, that actually might give you the information you would I know. Need. You know, so we've thought right. so hard about phys patient recruitment. Why don't we leave the patient recruitment to the end because we haven't done patients yet. We haven't. We've only piloted. So let me talk yeah, about sure. that on future work. Um, I'm just, just thinking so that would we can be get the easiest through. way to get your patients. Out. Yeah, but there are bias issues um, related to that that I'll I can I can talk about. But I w I'd love to show you some of the quotes. Um, so the analysis. What do we do? We transcribed all the interviews. If you need great transcription service, go to the Cornell Survey Research Institute. They're fabulous, um, and they'll even help you if you're from NYU. Um, we have three coders. Um, Kim is one. Um, uh, Maddie Murphy's the other, and I'm the third, and we formed a consensus on the code list itself and on all the transcript coding. So we each independently um, code every transcript and then come together and form consensus on all the codes and the quotations. It's a little um, tedious and we get very <coughs> tired and punchy, but I think the validity that it um, brings to the study is amazing. That it's very complimentary because I guess you get a little tired of coding, you know, and so you might miss one or someone else misses one. And so on balance, we all get them all, which is, uh, it's fun. And it's a nice group, so. Um, we then use a grounded theory approach to analyzing the data, which is basically backwards of what most quantitative people like myself even think about. Um, we generate a theory from our data or from our interviews and these, these transcriptions. 
So we're not really testing a hypothesis, but we're trying to find a theory that accounts for all of this information we're gathering in the interviews. It's an iterative process. At the start, you know, we thought we had our code list, then we transcribe a new interview from a new perspective and realize, oh, we forgot these different kinds of codes, let's add these, go back to the original ones, recode, and, um, and you, at some point you finalize your code list or you're going to go crazy. And you can't have too many codes, or again, you, you can't keep them all, not that we keep them in our heads, but you kind of do keep them in your head. Okay, so this preliminary sample, we have 27 people. We have about half radiation oncologists. We have a little more urban population, about 40% female. The average years in practice is very widely distributed, and a um, little less the percentage of patients with breast cancer for that physician is also very widely distributed. Okay, and so what have we found? So far, the factors involved in the decision to adopt APBI have to do with what we call facilitators, we call incentives, what we call pressures, another category, evidence needed before adoption, and then barriers. We had originally anticipated, well this was originally actually a qualitative social network analysis project, and the social network has not been nearly as interesting as I anticipated it would, which is um, perhaps the method we're using to gather that information or perhaps reality of, of what, um, what we found. So I had anticipated that um, social network would be more important. Okay, so let me give you a little schematic here. It shows you the factors we identify that influence the decision to adopt APBI or not adopt. Starting at the top, we have the facilitators of adoption, which are directly related to the decision to adopt. Facilitators are also related to incentives because in some cases, incentives can be facilitators. Like, ooh, look at all that money. What a great you know, reason. But incentives are, we considered, well, let me give you an example of facilitator. That could be someone encouraging use of adoption, one of your colleagues encouraging use. Um, it, it is related to incentives because that can be the money. It can also be um, uh, time factors that create an incentive to adopt the technology. It can also be, oh, I'd like to be at the forefront in my community and be an early adopter. That can be an incentive for a reputation, right, to have a good reputation. Um, and then going around the, the circle, we have pressures to adopt, which can be related to incentives like, oh my, I'm going to lose my patients if I don't start using this new technology because they may go elsewhere. Um, but there are other kinds of pressures, and I'll show you those. We also have barriers to adoption, things that would hold up adoption, which is, um, those are related to evidence needed. So. Um, the type and quality of evidence needed varies, obviously, by physician in their decision to adopt, but um, it kept coming up, one of the barriers was not enough evidence for um, uh, pushing someone over the hurdle to adopt the technology. Okay. So what are the facilitators we found? Encouragement from colleagues, older colleagues being enthusiasts, and and basically that's encouragement or it's, hey, I'm in charge and I want to do this, use this new technology. Or it could be the other way, hey, I'm in charge and I don't want to use this technology, so we won't be. Um, and also fascinating, because this is a device, the balloon brachytherapy is a device. Um, the device companies are matchmakers. They will, if there's a surgeon that approaches them, they'll find a radiation oncologist and vice versa. Um, they also provide very happy training courses in exotic <coughs> locations, I'm sure, um, and, they, and they really make matches to, to me. I'm a little cynical, I guess you can tell. Um, uh, so that's, that's been um, very interesting. Heather, did you, yeah. did you really share whether, um, like what, what portion of these physicians are using the technology? Is it 100 percent? Is that no? It's definitely or? not. You know, that's a good thing. Yeah. We should um, we should have put that in our our characteristics list. Mm -hmm. I'll make a note of that. Um, 
I don't know off the top of my head, but we have a mix. Mm -hmm. And we really shoot for a mix um, <coughs> for those random non-users. No, it's more people not using, I think, than using. Okay, so here's an example of a quote. So I'd like to present these quotes to you because they give you this flavor and color to the situation going on. Um, we just had to talk about it with finding a surgeon or two or three that wanted to do this and then encouraging them and giving them support as a colleague. So making it okay for the surgeons to start using this technology is what this radiation oncologist is talking about. And then another facilitator. So you had an influence on them, I ask? Because I'm the old lady in the office and so they're, they're the new kids on the block and there's no internal argument amongst themselves about that because they're younger. Okay, so she was pushy. You could call it a pressure, I guess, but we put it there as, an, as a facilitator. So what are incentives to adopt? A lot of physicians were saying, we're doing what's best for the patient. Whether that was to adopt and use it or to not adopt and not use it. They all think they're doing what's best for the patient. Obviously, financial gain is an issue. And then I mentioned this, improving your um, reputation or being the first on the block with a new technology. So some quotes. Well, I mean, obviously, the surgeon says that. If they can have partial breast, I, I will make money off that. But if I send them for external beam, obviously, you know, that's all the radiation oncologist part. So obviously, you know, the more partial breasts you do, probably the better financially you do. And this, I mean, so beautifully gets to this point. The surgeons won't make any money off radiation oncology unless they're implanting this device. And they're actually paid to implant and explant, and almost none of them do the explant. The radiation oncologist takes the, the device out at the end of the week. Um, so anyway, there's another example. What does the radiation oncologist say? We're not for, for profit, and so the doctors are all salaried. We don't get paid more depending on which technology we use. We just recommend what we think is best for the patient's unique circumstance. Okay, pressures. I mentioned this, the threats to the referral base if you don't adopt, whether that's um, surgeons no longer referring to the radiation oncologist or the patients leaving on their own because they might want this treatment. There, many physicians mention pressure from patients, although I remember one explicitly said, the patients come in here like a blank slate. They don't know anything about radiation. Whatever I tell them is all they know. So I think it depends a little on the how savvy the patient population is of the different physicians um, and, and how clued in. And that could be related to socioeconomic status. Um, and then pressure from colleagues. So the surgeon says, patients start to push for things they hear about or want before there's full data out. And then you're kind of stuck in that situation where will you or won't you? Radiation oncologist says, the radiation oncologists tend to be a little bit more cautious about it, but it's something that I think the industry, or at least patients and surgeons, are pushing strongly. It's not entirely true. You know, it's, it, this is one quote from one radiation oncologist. We also met a radiation oncologist who's a brachytherapist and loves it and is going to use it and is not conservative. So this just gives you a flavor of a, of a non-adopt. I think this is a non-adopt. Okay, barriers to adoption. One of the biggest ones is that um, you, the one physician will need a colleague in the other specialty for the referral. There has to be a joint decision in order to use this technology because the surgeon implants and the um, radiation oncologist does the treatment. Um, we found an interesting um, factor that in some small communities, it's hard to be an early adopter because if you have bad outcomes, you could really ruin your reputation. What we, what I had originally thought, you know, qualitative research, you're not supposed to be hypothesis testing, you're not supposed to have hypotheses, but you have hunches, you have ideas. And I thought in small communities, this would be the perfect treatment modality because whether it's 3D conformal external beam or mammocyte, um, it's, if you're in a rural area, that travel burden is so huge for radiation. If you could get it done in five days, you know, why wouldn't you? Um, but in fact, in small communities, there may be more of a risk um, in, in taking a leap into new technology. Mm -hmm. So another um, 
theme that came up was the lack of enthusiasm or willingness to learn something new. Equipment not being available or the, the cost of equipment or cost of newing, doing this new technology. There's certain staff requirements that are different. Um, administrative hurdles like getting approval from the hospital and malpractice concerns. Here's an example of a surgeon's barrier. There's a tendency for practitioners, especially in community hospitals or smaller areas, to be a little isolated from newer technologies from a cultural standpoint. There are several other surgeons in my community who have kind of a suspicious eye to new and different things. In a small community, you have to be a little bit cautious about not really being in the vanguard because local recurrences or poor outcomes can really kill your program. It was a great interview. Okay, and then a surgeon said, and when I started wanting to do it, I didn't have any place to send the patients to get treated. We had a story about a, a surgeon who was sending patients over the state line to some radiation oncologist who would do the treatment in the hospital, started getting wind of what was really going on. The, the hospital is actually then lo losing that money from radiation treatment and uh, negotiations were made. So here's a radiation oncologist. The other reason is probably, this is a non-adopter. The other reason is probably that I'm at the stage in my career that I'm not that excited about spending time learning new techniques. That might be part of it, honestly. I think he was on his way to retirement. Um, evidence needed before adoption, that was another theme we found. Um, physicians may prefer the randomized controlled trials, but there are other levels of ed evidence that will suffice. They often use their intu intuition and say things like the technology makes sense, and that's based on the um, evidence around um, where do elsewhere tumors occur um, with whole breast radiation. Um, and then others <coughs> say if they wait for others to use it and there's widespread adoption, then some, it suddenly becomes okay that there's a community standard about it even without the randomized trial evidence. So here's, um, here's a quote from a radiation oncologist. I think waiting for randomized trial results to come to bear fruit is really doing patients a disservice and really is kind of an outdated way of practicing medicine. I think it validates current day practice in a lot of ways, but I think there's plenty of other very good data out there that can drive innovation in clinical practice. Here's some other quotes. Uh, separate interviews. Another radiation oncologist says, I think that's, that that's very reasonable to start using it when major centers are using it. I remember pushing that person, well, what's a major center? How do you define, you know, who's a, a quality place that you can emulate? Um, so that, that was an interesting um, interview. A surgeon said, but it's just something that made intuitive sense, and you could sit on the sidelines and wait for randomized data and clinical trials but you'd be waiting for a really long time and you know, I'm in the trenches operating on people now and looking at them now and you know, that's something that made sense. So it's almost like they're talking themselves into it. Um, what are our preliminary conclusions from all of this? That surgeons and radiation oncologists have to develop partnerships and agree to adoption or force the other one into adoption if they're going to end up using this. And if they can't find a partner, then they won't be able to provide this service. We, we found that technology evolves quickly, and the physicians are ready to act on often limited information or based on their in intuition if they're adopting. If they're not adopting, they say there's not enough evidence yet. I'm not comfortable with the evidence. The standards for high-quality evidence were so different across physicians. Um, some of our more recent interviews, people have been talking about five years follow-up and that really was all that mattered, whether it was randomized or not. We really want five years and, you know, I pushed them a little bit on that. If the study's not done well and it's still five years, you know, <laughs> is that still good, you know, is that enough? Um, we also found the issue of insurance coverage um, and how that plays a role in here. So. Um, that really only seems to matter for specific patients. So will I use this technology on this patient?
but it doesn't seem to matter so much on whether the physician adopts it in practice. And that's, I mean, I think because Medicare is covering it. And so um, we have found these isolated stories, particularly about Blue Cross Blue Shield not covering um, partial breast radiation. Um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association has a really nice technology assessment showing that this is not ready for prime time. And so I think um, the local uh, coverage decisions have reflected that. Um, there are, have been plenty of radiation oncologists who brought up the issue around about reimbursement, that they're worried about reimbursement. They're used to getting, um, you know, five days a week for, say, six weeks. That's 30 sessions of payment. If they're going to do partial breast irradiation, they're really reducing that, um, that reimbursement per patient, right? So instead, you see this um, bottom chart. I tried to do a back of the envelope for you showing that um, say if you had seven weeks of treatment, five sessions a week for whole breast radiation, your total number of sessions would be 35 sessions. Canadian fractionation is four weeks of treatment um, and gives you 20 sessions. With partial breast irradiation, you have one week of treatment yielding 10 total sessions, but if you increased your volume of partial breast patients, you could in fact do fine. And, and we heard a story, at least one story about a physician who's like, I am the referral center and I'm drumming up business and I'm sending out flyers. I mean, someone was sending out flyers like not just to breast cancer patients, like to the general population, which I thought was interesting, but the device company provides them and they're shiny. Um, so uh, so I, kinda, I feel like the radiation oncologists are worried about the reimbursement, but in fact, if they got good at this and could get the volume, they can make up that difference. So what are the implications? Um, Community-based physicians may be adopting the technology due to financial incentives, pressures from patients and colleagues, and community norms, but without long-term trial-based evidence. The physicians who are not adopting are seen as laggards by the ones who are adopting. They're seen as not making sense by the ones who are adopting. And so it's a very interesting dichotomy between these two. What are our next steps? And we've got a little bit into this and I tabled. So we're continuing our recruitment, our interviews, and our analysis. We're still continuing to target the rural physicians, <coughs> academic physicians, um, and any patients eligible for APBI. And what I wanted to just mention here, the way we are planning to recruit to try to minimize bias is to go through um, hospital or healthcare institution tumor registries and look chronologically reverse order for any patients who may have been eligible for partial breast radiation, whether or not they got it. And in this way, we won't have, it's, we don't have to go through a physician who either pressured a patient towards the treatment or against the treatment. We don't have to know, um, we don't have to get information. One of the things I'm worried about is that um, the physicians will choose the compliant patients to refer to us for the study, whether they're adopters or non-adopters. And so by going through a, um, the tumor registry at the hospital, we hope to avoid um, getting entangled in some of that bias. I think I also mentioned that I'm working on a large-scale population-based analysis of the diffusion of partial breast irradiation using Medicare claims, and another study um, funded separately looking at the costs and complications of partial breast irradiation, again, uh, looking at Medicare. I think that is it. <laughs> Welcome, any questions or comments? Or? Um, something that I think is really neat about this is that, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it seems very clear that some of the principles that you're, um, that you're kind of building and informing, like, clearly apply to other technologies. And just in, you know, I, I, I did one study on technology adoption. I spent a ton of time going through the literature, and there's, there's one paper, and I can't remember the first author, but it was published in Health Services Research probably 15 years ago at least, mm -hmm. that provided this sort of framework of, you know, in sort of a similar style as what you've done in terms of kind of barriers, incentives, and, and those, uh, those pieces. And there really has not been much work that I've seen that has sort of thought about these macro adoption issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, I mean, it seems like very 
ripe for, um, for kind of generalizing to sort of developing a sort of a model of, um, of adoption that could be generalized to other other technologies. Mm -hmm. and kind of, is that something that you well, that's an interesting or? point. That's really glowing yeah. now, isn't it? Um, the um, when I was um, pulling together all the ideas for this, I was really drawing from economics, drawing from sociology, drawing from the medical literature, and trying to be very broad based. So maybe I can um, develop a little paradigm here for thinking about this going forward. Um, it, it's very, in, in, very interdisciplinary in the approach. Um, and, and the social network, the sociology component just really hasn't felt deep enough. Like we just really haven't gotten as much there as I had hoped. And that um, adds a richness. But you know, thinking about the supply side, the demand side, the social network, and all these other different factors, and integrating, we've tried to integrate them into this study. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I was going to mention the same thing, um, Joe. There is um, quite a bit of literature, actually, on this. Maybe not in the social network, but the uh, implementation diffusion, I think it's Rogers' diffusion of innovation right. theory. That's what this uh, is based on. Yeah. There's something called the technology acceptance model by Ben Katesh, which would be definitely worth looking at. OK. Uh, I'm and I've seen that. recently, relatively recently developed. He's done a really nice job. And, um, and then there was a recent paper by this woman, Laura Damschroeder, who actually did this phenomenal review of all the implementation dissemination literature and looking at all the frameworks and has actually created a consolidated framework of implementation research, which in many ways is the same. The factors that influence implementation are the same often as influence dissemination and adoption. So I, I would look at those. I mean, the, the Dan Schroeder article is very recent, and she does a really nice job of, of sort of talking about where the domains are that you might want to um, expand on, especially if you're continuing to do your interviews. Be nice to match up what you're finding and see if you can maybe expand your survey tool to sort of get into some of these other variables that are brought in some of these models. I mean, some of the comments I would make too is um, you know, when I was at Leonard Davis Institute at UPenn, Sandy Schwartz is one of the big names and or used to be at least. He helped form the initial proposal. Yeah, so, you know, where we're at with this is, yeah. you know, and, and going along with what, what everyone else is saying is one of the nice things about qualitative inquiry is to triangulate your findings with that of the theory. So it'd be interesting to see how your model is shaping compared to some of these other models. To it, It's a way of, uh, it's called theoretical triangulation to mm -hmm. try to validate your your findings. Mm -hmm. So that's something um, worth looking. And the other thing which is really difficult, you know, I, I, someone have, uh, who's come from health economics background as well and went into qualitative inquiry, qualitative inquiry is by nature biased. That's what it, it always is. And so, but the way we learn from that is by acknowledging those biases, mm -hmm. by saying who the team was, who was interviewed and all that. And then, it, you know, in, in some ways I find it more pure research because other forms of research are trying to claim that there are no biases when in fact there always are. So um, the fact that you're doing 144 interviews is probably important here because I, I see some stratum developing, those mm -hmm. who actually work in centers where they're salaried versus those who mm -hmm. are. So to, you, it'd be uh, <coughs> worthwhile trying to get some saturation amongst those yes, key elements, right? right? Yes, yeah, and that now it makes sense why it's such a uh, you know, generally you would only have like around you know maybe 40, 30 interviews top. So no, it's, it's excellent work. I mean, I, I, I think it's going all in the right direction. And like I said, it's not the questions; it's the answers. You're getting wonderful answers. So. When you're conducting these interviews and studies, and you're talking to the radiation oncologist, are you differentiating between mammocyte versus the external beam? Yes, you are. We talk about um, external beam. We talk about brachytherapy, and not just mammocyte either, because Savvy and Contura. Uh, and, and even multi-lumen mammocyte, is, it's different, right? You have these next generation catheters. Who's adopting those and not just the initial? Some people stick with the tried and true brachytherapy even. So yes, we have been talking about all these things. We have not found a lot of 3D conformal users yet, just because of who we've shot at, you know? So um, it's, it's definitely an area. It's one of our strata, <laughs> strata um, that we need to fill out. Yes.
Oh, well, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.